everybody. We're going to go ahead and get this um, meeting started. Uh, we're going to start out with an uh, invocation. If Commissioner Harvey, if you could uh, come up and lead us in that. Let us bow. Father, we thank you for this day, a wonderful day for Putnam County and surrounding areas. We ask, Lord, that everything we do today be giving you honor and glory. Father, watch our tongues. Give us wisdom directly from your throne room. Let us be receptive to one another today, Father. And Lord, we thank you for this holiday season that you gave your son, Jesus Christ. We ask everything in his name. Amen. 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 Joe Pink is going to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance. I think uh, we know everybody, but the formalities, I'm Senator Keith Perry, District 8, which encompasses all of Putnam County, all of Alachua County, and most of Marion County. And Representative Payne, Representative Payne from uh, Putnam County, but I represent Putnam, Bradford, Union, and portions of Clay, District 19. Thank you. Just a, a couple of announcements real quick. The uh, 2021 legislative session will convene on March 2nd. We will have interim committee meetings in January and February, two weeks in January uh, 11th through the 15th and the 25th through the 29th, February 8th through the 12th, 15th through the 19th, and the 1st through the 5th. I'm sorry, I missed that one. Uh, if you want to be on the agenda and speak and you have not filled out a card or you're not on this, if you can please do that and we'll have, make sure we have time for you to speak. Um, just a, a couple of things before we start. Um, biggest issue, probably everybody aware of, will be appropriations. And the one thing that constitutionally that we are required to do every uh, session is pass a budget. Um, and that is also, um, but, but that's going to be a little bit difficult this year with the, with the uh, COVID. Uh, there's different predictions that we have out there. We've heard from two, right now it's about two to four billion dollars less that we will have to spend and uh, it's a little unfortunate we were finally getting into the uh, some of the backlog of water projects and a lot of the other major things that we've been responsible for we started getting a handle on that and um, and catching up on some of the things that have been back for a while but that's gonna be it's gonna be a difficult year uh, next year and the year after that uh, a little bit of a bright side the last three months uh, the revenues that came in have exceeded what the um, estimates were so we're we're trending on a different uh, way than we were a few months ago uh, the governor was just down in Tampa a few days ago he got the first shipment of the vaccine he signed for that from FedEx and that was starting to be distributed and you're going to see that uh, really ramp up and especially with maybe some of the other vaccines from Madura and stuff so our hope and our prayer is that we get uh, the state back um, to um, where we should be uh, but it's still, no matter if we, uh, we're back 100% today, we're still going to have budget shortfalls. So uh, our job is is to make sure that Putnam County um, doesn't, uh, you know, we hold harmless as much as we can, but it's going to be a battle. I'm, I'm thankful, and we all should be thankful, that we got Representative Payne here who has uh, moved quickly up in leadership in Tallahassee uh, that gives him a seat at the table at the inner circle. So he's uh, uh, done a good job representing us uh, in this area and we'll continue to do that. So, but just to let you know, that's what we're going to be working on. And we want to we want to hear from you on any of these issues, not just appropriations on anything, but, but without them being probably the biggest, uh, the issues that we come up, we're going to start early on these things on what is important for this county, and start working on the budget side early uh, to get uh, get a place placeholders up there and work on that. So, with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, Commissioner Harvey, we're going to have you back up. So you are recognized. Um. Thank you, Senator Payne. Representative, I mean, Senator <laughs> Got a promotion Perry. already. That's great. Representative <laughs> Payne. I usually don't speak from this side. I usually right, speak from that side. There's a nervous section. Makes you a little there. nervous there, doesn't it? Yeah, a little bit. I do want to welcome you to Putnam County as y'all are here all the time, and we really appreciate it. Today we're going to go over some of our legislative priorities, but before we do, Commissioner Pickens is here with me to my left. 
to my right, Commissioner Turner is with us and Commissioner Rawls. Commissioner Adamczak could not make it today. Our staff is our County Administrator, Mr. Terry Suggs, Deputy County Administrator, Julianne Holmes Young, and our Legislative Grants and Special Projects, Sam Sullivan's with us today. And uh, we just wanna say thank you again for having us. Um, there's a couple priorities, but I'm gonna let the commissioners and those districts uh, kind of explain item one and two, and I'll take item three. So Commissioner Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to say that I uh, would like to uh, reiterate uh, his, uh, the chairman's welcome to y'all to come to the county. We appreciate it. We pre pre appreciate your representation. Uh, item number one on the appropriation list is a project that we've been working on for three years now. We've uh, it's a multi-year funded project. We received two, the first two uh, portions of the money. And so any consideration that you could give us would be helpful in trying to finish that project out. We're about halfway through the projected cost of finishing that up. So, uh, and it's basically to minimize the flooding and the mitigation risk for the residential and agricultural community in the East Black area. So we've received, uh, I believe it's 955,000 of the 2 million originally that we thought we needed to uh, complete the project. So thank you for any consideration you could give us on that. Good afternoon, I'm Jeff Rawls, representing District 2 in the county and thank you very much for your uh, coming to our, our county and hearing our needs. So uh, I'm uh, under uh, number two, um, the Northern area of Putnam County, Boswick and Barden in specific, uh, we've got a lot of issues with, with uh, flooding, uh, major rain events, uh, minor rain events sometimes uh, creates a lot of havoc for our residents. So uh, we're asking um, for a little over $4 million to minimize the flooding risk that directly impacts our residents and agricultural properties uh, while significantly protecting the economic agricultural pursuits, future development opportunities with the construction of the Outer Beltway. And, and the Outer Beltway, as it starts, is really going to put a lot of pressure on us, and we're really going to need these these areas to be drained and, and the roads to be under good repair. So, would ask for any consideration that you could give us, and we thank you in advance for that. Thank you, Commissioner Turner, Commissioner Rawls, and last and final is the Ark. That's our special needs uh, center right behind this building. Uh, you know where that's at to enhance the public access pool facility by expanding and improving the current pool deck shade screens, build dedicated safety exits, and uh, pickleball courts, and re redesigning the parking area. That's a big need for that area. Um, if you haven't been to the ARC, we would encourage all of our residents to go and see the remarkable work that's done. And gentlemen, that concludes our priority list. So thank you very much for being here, and any questions we can answer, we'll be glad to do so. Guys are reading from a list and we didn't have it, so we'd, we'd have it now. So, um, yeah, I would just say be mindful, as the senator said earlier, um, the talk because of the shortfalls we have this year, that we will probably come back to you and let you arm wrestle out the one project that you may get in the appropriations. We understand. It'll be difficult. Okay. We understand. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Appreciate Thank it. you. Thank you. And before I go on, just I want to introduce our staff. So I. Suzanne, Keenan, Jessica, I think was checking in people out there. Uh, they do a great job and uh, make sure that you have contact information for me, you reach me directly, but also uh, th they know the inner workings can get stuff done. So just make sure you know who they are and you can introduce your staff. Thank you, Senator. Most of you know uh, my staff, Leona Wilkinson is our local district secretary. She's, she's out sick today. Um, I also have Tammy Steele who works in our office in Bradford. We share an office there with, uh, with Senator Jay Bradley, and then I have a new legislative uh, uh, affairs uh, person um, in LA, and Sarah Lynn Ard. And Sarah, we're glad to have her on our team. She is a new addition to us in the last few weeks, and she's already making a difference in our team. So feel free to contact uh, our office at any time, and um, we will hopefully continue to get back to you in a prompt manner like we have. So thanks, Senator. Next, we have uh, Joe Pickens president of the St. John's River State College. Thank you for being here, you're recognized. Thank you, gentlemen, I'm Joe Pickens. Uh, Representative Payne would know really around here anymore, I'm known as uh, Bill Pickens' brother and Holly Pickens' brother-in-law. But today I'm here representing St. John's River State College 
and as chair of the Florida College System Council of Presidents, you guys are going to hear enough whining over the next four months, and that's not what I'm here to do. You have a tough job, and, um, and I know you're going to do it well. Florida College System requests that our base funding be held as, uh, as firm as it can. We know that cuts are going to come. We've already um, absorbed a 6% holdback, as you know, from the executive branch. We expect the legislature to carry through with that. It's easier to cut money that we haven't received, and we get that. But we do ask that when other, if other cuts are necessary, that it come from performance funding and other peripheral things, and that our base funding uh, be maintained in the way that it already has. And also that if you're going to take more money away from us, that you take it back in the way that was put in. That way it's equitable to all 28 of us and the 28 college presidents have asked me to say two things. One is when cuts occur to us, take it away in the same way that it was put in. So all the colleges are treated the same. The second one is, and it doesn't require any additional money, and that is this. The Florida College System PICO allocation among public education, historically, from the time that I was in the legislature up until two years ago, has been about 25%. Two years ago, it was cut to 3 3%. The Florida legislature felt as though the Florida College System as a whole, all 900,000 of us, of our students, were only worthy of 3% of the total public education PICO allocation a huge change in policy. When Superintendent Surrency speaks to you, he's not going to tell you that he received any additional money uh, because of our cut. So the Florida College System number two asks that our percentage of the PICO allocation to public education be restored to 25 percent. We're not asking you for any more money, we're only asking you for our fair share of the PICO allocation as has occurred historically. Thank you for your service, and especially thank you for the very difficult decisions you're going to have to make in the next two years. Yeah, and, and just um, a note on that, a couple things. One is I've, I've already reached out to leadership. One of the things I've suggested and hope they take it is that we don't look at just cuts across the board evenly. I mean, if you, if you had a business that was struggling, you would look at where your key responsibilities are and, uh, and focus on those first. The PICO funds, which has been unfortunate, I mean, we have less money. I mean, if you're aware of PICO funds and how that's – uh, gained by the state is that's through landlines, telephone lines mainly. Well, that's uh, been dropping every year. We have less and less landlines, and so that funding has been down. The goal for us is to come up with some time, at some point in time, we got to come up with a new funding source uh, that will be a dedicated one where you don't have to fight for it every year. But, but back to the state colleges, I know that um, uh, the Senate President, Wilton Simpson, uh, is, is not going to take the same approach. Uh, that his predecessors took in the state college systems. The bang for the buck of what you provide and the cost of the state uh, is, a, is a lot different than it is at the university level. So I, I, I'm hopeful that you'll see, uh, you won't see that change. It'll still be difficult with less money, but the state colleges took huge hits, and I'm, at least in the, in the Senate, we'll make, let Bobby go do his work over there in the House, that we're going to be, be in a different position for the state colleges. So. Right, I would echo the same that we've already had discussions on the House side with um, Speaker D. Renner, and I know you have as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope to see that balance of, uh, of the current administration shift back in favor of state colleges so that we know, and, and public education, so that we know that um, that's where a lot of our workforce is coming from. So, thank you, President. Well, let me, uh, Senator Perry, let me say that um, I understand completely that there's only one state senator that lives in Gainesville. And the pressure that you have to support the university system is completely understood by this college president and this former legislator. So let me especially thank you for the support that you've shown to our system um, throughout. Representative Payne, I have to say that I take you for granted and that's not fair, it's not right, but um, it does go to the steadfast support that you've given to our community and to, our, to the community through our college um, from the very beginning. So thank you both for your support um, and your expected support of the Florida College System. You got it. Thank, thank you. you. Next we have Tim Parker. Putnam County Property Appraiser, thank you for being here. You are recognized. Thank you and thank you for being here today. 
House Bill 1249 was implemented this past legislative session, took effect on July 1, 2020. Uh, it provides for a prorated refund of taxes paid by certain qualifying veterans or their surviving spouses. It was implemented in Florida Chapter 196.081. Just to let you know that across the state, people have been taking advantage of that already. So it's helping our veterans uh, as it was intended to. This last legislative session, I'm not sure if uh, Mike Twitty, who is the Pinellas County property appraiser, got actually a bill put in place. It did not pass if it, if it was even considered, but what he's working on is a, a bill that would be somewhat similar to the uh, calamity provisions that are in place currently. So a calamity provision provides for if your home is destroyed by a calamity, it could be fire, flood, uh, some other natural source. Um, so what happens is if your home is destroyed by a calamity, your value gets to stay what it is. And then if you rebuild, then you, you get to keep that base value even though you've got essentially a new home. So his provision in some of the flood zone areas are people that are contemplating mitigating some of the risk that occurs because they are in a flood plain. So they would actually be raising their house up, perhaps, in order to mitigate some flood damage. Not that it got damaged yet, but there was increased cost, there would be increased assessed value associated with raising that home up to mitigate the flood uh, impact. And so his bill would be proposing that we would treat that like a calamity provision. It wouldn't actually add to the value of the home but um, it would at some point, you know, limit the, uh, the uh, response that we would have to have uh, to handle a, a potentially uh, bad situation there. Uh, last year, there were some potentially very harmful uh, language and, and provisions within the house tax package and they were essentially or eventually not uh, implemented. So we appreciate uh, you, you all uh, working with us on that. And we'll be there if you have any questions for us. Um, just please give me a call and we'll get you, get you heading in the right direction. Sure. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Jim. You've always been a good resource to call, so appreciate that. Thank you. Charles Overturf, Supervisor of Elections. You're on deck. Thank you. Thank you, and thank both of you for being here. And Bobby, congratulations on being reelected, and thank wish you, you both the, the very best. What I wanted to bring to your attention, uh, I think we all are understanding of, of how citizens' initiatives and petitions and amendments get on the ballot. And one of the things that I have been hearing lately in the last couple of years is uh, legislature or the administration in Tallahassee upset because certain things get put on the ballot and then get passed, and it's sort of a way to go around maybe you all having a say so and I'm, so I just want to bring an issue today uh, to you and that was amendment four um, I heard that both parties and I deal with both sides uh, were against that amendment and it did fail but very close uh, I think it was about two or three percentage points if it's like marijuana then they'll bring it back next uh, two years from now and it will pass uh, that's sort of the trend that happens when it's something like that. So I guess my point to you is, to me, you all in the legislature, you know, if, if there's something that you want to see that you don't agree with, then maybe it's, it's uh, you know, should be taken up by you all to come up with something that might be a compromise to both parties that you all can live with and that the public can live with. Um, because as we've seen over the years, certain things, uh, like the minimum wage and some of those that a lot of people were uh, or legislature was against it gets passed anyway so I just thought I would come today and mention that particular amendment and say maybe you all on both sides of the aisle can sit here and look at something and say you know we're going to be proactive about it because we do have 3.6 million residents in the state of Florida that are either no party or a minor party and a little bit over 5 million registered Republican and registered Democrat. So there is a big uh, 3.6, there's a lot of people in this state that are asking to have a say so about primaries. So I just wanna throw that back to you and say, you know, you all in your wisdom and, and knowledge, uh, maybe you can come up with something that, uh, you know, will be satisfactory to the legislature, the governor, and also to the people. 
have your association or to be come up with an idea on possible legislation or is that just kind of enough no sir we don't because that to me steps us over the idea of being impartial or being neutral about it we sort of would look to you all to and then we would follow of course whatever gets passed by the judge or by the legislature or by the voters but we try to stay away from <laughs> taking sides sure. uh you know as far as that's concerned no, great suggestion yeah thank suggestion. you all okay rick cernsey Superintendent of Putnam County School District. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Palatka. Glad to be here. Rick Cernsey, Superintendent of Schools of Putnam County. We introduce Holly Pickens, our new chairman of the Putnam County School Board. And I think her name's been brought up before by President Pickens and Bill Pickens, of course, is her husband. But uh, I want to thank you guys for being here and um, especially the, um, the help you provided us last year. You know, we received an appropriation, uh, $250,000 for a public service academy. Thanks to Representative Payne for sponsoring that. But we've already put that money to work and we're really trying to build the workforce here in Putnam County, which I know is one of the governor's uh, priorities. But we've actually used some of that money to partner with our local agencies. We recently uh, received a fire unit not sure what the technical name is, but it's a, it's a little trailer or something that catches on fire and you practice putting it out. And we've actually had our local fire department with J.R. Grimes out there having a good time uh, training his people to train our students on how to use that apparatus. And uh, it will be housed at Palatka High School, but we could not have done that without the help of uh, that appropriation. So I know this year is going to be um, a lean year and I know that, um, you know, especially last year, the governor's uh, priority on providing salary increases for especially new teachers has been very much appreciated. And we've already settled with our union, so our teachers are going to be benefiting from that very soon. So thank you for providing that as well, especially in tough times. But I represent the school district and also represent um, the NEFEC districts. Um, I'm the chairman of the board. I know Patrick we're next going to be here and ask for some um, consideration on some topics. But there's two things I want to bring up that relate to both uh, Putnam County and the NEFEC school districts. Number one thing has to do with funding, like everybody else is talking about. And I know things are going to be lean, and I know we're trying to position our school district for a very lean year. But one thing that I would ask that you would consider is is focus on increasing the BSA as opposed to categoricals. And uh, that's where we can have a lot more flexibility to meet our needs uh, in a lean year. And also look at providing some flexibility with those categoricals. You know, if we do need to spend some money or uh, have the flexibility to use some funds from those categoricals, that would sure help us out a lot in a lean year next year. The other thing I would ask has to do with accountability. And again, it's, it's already, uh, we've already been told by the commissioner that, uh, you know, we'll be doing tests, which I welcome that. We need to test our students. We need to know how they are, their, their learning gains. And uh, so far, there will be school grades. So we understand that and we appreciate that. But the only thing that we're asking is, is that other entities be held to the same accountability that public schools are. And specifically private schools, charter schools, Anyone receiving vouchers or scholarships from taxpayers' money, we would ask for the same transparency and accountability that public schools are held to. So again, if that's something you could uh, address, that would sure be helpful because this is taxpayers' money and we wanna make sure that um, you know these students are also being successful like the students in the public school system. So with that, thank you again for being here and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to call me. Is there any um, movement on, on having the, the uh, step up for students or any of those other ones as far as testing goes? Has that been those out or is that, I, I haven't read the policy from the uh, commissioner. As far as the uh, testing this year? Goes. Right. As far as I know, it's, um, you know, same as normal. I mean, we, we did not have a test last year. So we're going to be using uh, the test this year, same testing calendar as I understand. Um, you know, we'll have to look at learning gains from two years ago. So we, we need to test our kids. You know, we need to know how they are progressing. But again, you know, this is one of those years where we've had a lot of kids that are 
in, inside and outside of school. And, and we've been teaching kids online, doing the best we can, like all the other districts. But, you know, having students in front of a teacher is the most effective way of teaching kids, and we recognize that. But, again, you know, we're, we're all about accountability, and we just want to make sure that other entities that teach kids are held to the same standards that we are going forward. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you. A couple of quick questions. Yes. And you may know this off the top of your head, that the percentage of students in class as opposed to those that are doing virtual learning, is there, do you know that percentage? Yeah, we're right at 80% uh, face-to-face. Face-to-face. And, um, and we've been, especially after the first grading period, we've been encouraging those students to come back face-to-face, -face, uh, especially if they were not being successful at home. Right. Um, and again, if, and again, this is per the uh, order of the commissioner, right. is if parents still continue to want their child at home, we, uh, we understand that and we respect that out of choice, but we want to make sure the parents understand if they're not being successful, they need to accept that responsibility, that we, we are encouraging them to come back if they are not being successful. And then what percentage of, at the beginning of school year, were, 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 did you have of students that were absent that weren't no, were no longer in, in the school system because that affects the fun Big time, formula. yeah, there are, did not enter students. Right. Uh, we had, I'll tell you, in August, we had about 20% of our students that we could not locate at one time. And uh, you multiply that out, that's a pretty significant amount. We have been doing a lot of detective work and knocking on doors and, you know, we, uh, we are down to probably about 2% now. So we've really, you know, made, did a good job trying to find these kids because that is an important part of our funding. Right. Good. And thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Holly. Thanks. Thank you, Holly. I'm not sure if anybody's here, but I'm going to go down the uh, communities and see if there's someone who wants to speak on their behalf. So anybody from the town of Interlochen that's here, about from the city of Palatka, anybody here from the city wants to speak? Pannona Park, or Wilatka. Just want to make sure I give you an opportunity. Uh, before I get into public comment, is there any other person from a government agency or official that is not on this list that would like to address the delegation? All right. Well, then we'll get in. We've got, we've got someone oh. raising their hand. Come on up. Here's Kelly. my comment card a minute late. Uh, we had a brief opportunity to meet. I'm Matt Metz with the Office of the Public Defender. Okay. Uh, recently elected to the office, and I'll keep my comments brief as I have had a limited opportunity to speak with you already. And Representative Payne, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you now. As you gentlemen both well know, the Office of the Public Defender is one of the most important constitutional offices as it does represent and keep safe those constitutional rights that all the people here hold dear. Uh, we have always been an organization as pride of ourselves uh, as running on a very lean budget, uh, and that has been very true for a long time. Uh, as you well know, we're currently working with and doing our best to maintain the 6% holdback uh, that's currently being applied to us. Uh, and I just want to reiterate comments that I previously made. Uh, we certainly hope that those, that first, that those cuts don't become permanent and that they don't go any farther. Uh, I wish I could come up here and ask for something other than an appropriation issue for you because I know everyone else has the exact same issue. Uh, Florida's in a tough place. Uh, I would just like to point out that our organization uh, deals with something that uh, whether or not roads are fixed, whether or not uh, the kids have the best organization uh, in school, someone in jail is always facing their liberty taken away. And that's something that doesn't happen whether or not we have a pothole. I'd ask you give us some consideration for that uh, we'll do our best to make the absolute best use of any money that you do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we got, uh, next up we got Patrick uh, Winnick. Yeah, sorry. Keep Good seeing you. You're recognized. Both Senator Perry and Representative Payne, thank you for being here today. Um, representing NEFAC and the 80 employees that we have that work right out here out of uh, Palatka. Um, we have had some challenging times this year in our school districts, but um, I'm happy to say that our NEFEC districts were one of the first to open. Um, we had some that were at 95% um, capacity and face-to-face. -face. We've had the commissioner out, the governor, um, has gone to some of our football games. So we've really led the way in a lot of ways during, during this, um, this pandemic. Uh, 
and our districts are, are meeting the needs of our students. One of the unique things about um, the consortium is that our districts are able to do more with less. Um, a lot of these large districts have huge staffs, so when these mandates are passed or you have to turn around a continuity plan or put into effect something like we had with the virus, they bring a huge group of people together. And what we do in the consortium is we bring all of our district leads, our superintendents, um, Dr. Shurns, he does a wonderful job as our chair, and we work on these things together. We share resources, uh, we have a risk management plan. All of these things are an effort to really lower costs for our districts. And the, the funding that we receive with the Tri Consortia, we have PACE, HEC, and NEFEC, um, it allows us to do that. It allows us to kind of uh, have the foundation to have these services. And then our districts actually will, they pay into these services. So they, they contract with us for other things. So it's really a unique, we as a consortium need to meet their needs and perform. And they are doing just that. Um, I'll give you one example in the college and career acceleration realm, a grade component within the school grade formula. That shows that a student is graduating with either an industry cert or a college uh, AP course or ACE, we rank, four of our districts rank in the top 10 in the state. So rural Florida is in a better place, I think, because the rural districts, the superintendents, we work together. We have a new superintendent in uh, Union County, Mike Ripplinger. Uh, he worked under uh, Carlton Falk for 20 years, and Carlton retired, um, did a, a fabulous job with our board. We have a new superintendent in Bradford, Will Hartley, and we're, we're gonna be supporting Will. And then uh, we've, we've worked with Linda Hayes for years at PK Young. She's a member of our board. Um, so, and of course, Dr. Cernsey and all the great things they've done here in Putnam County. Thank you for all that you do. We, I know that during the session, um, you represent us. You explain what we do. A lot of the larger um, uh, communities and counties, they don't understand who, what the consortium does. Sometimes we don't have anyone on the Ed Committee or the um, Appropriations Committee. Um, you have championed our cause. Senator Bradley did a, an incredible job, and, and so did uh, Representative Travis Cummings. Again, this year, it'll be the same. Every year, it seems like we're having to defend what we do um, at the consortium, but I think our performance speaks for itself, and more than ever, our districts are going to need our support to come alongside them and help them um, build these programs and continue to offer great uh, academic programs for our, for our students. So if you have any questions um, regarding related to education or anything related to the consortium, I can answer those. Good, thanks. Look forward to working with you. Thank you very much, as well. appreciate it. Thank you, Doc. I'm very familiar because my office is at NEPAC, so yes. thanks for Thank picking some. <laughs> uh, Nancy Russo. Good afternoon, Senator Payne and Representative, Senator Perry, Representative Payne. Oh, Promotion again. It's already starting. Um, my name is Nancy Russo, and I'm the Vice President of Putnam County Services for SMA Healthcare. And first, I want to thank you for your continued support that allows us to provide crucial behavioral health services to Putnam County. Included in your folder is the 2021 Legislative Priorities for Behavioral Health. It highlights the ongoing need for reoccurring funding for crucial services such as medication assisted treatment, family intensive treatment team, community action treatment teams, and mobile response teams. And next, I would like to introduce Sandra Jackson, who is the Vice President of St. John's County um, SMA, who oversees the FACT team for both Putnam and St. John's counties, so she can emphasize the importance of our FACT team. Good afternoon. In front of you, you have an infographic of some of the accomplishments of the FACT program during the 1920 fiscal year. We're very grateful that you've continued to support the FACT team. FACT team stands for Florida Assertive Community Treatment and serves 100 of the most severely mentally ill in our community. These are the individuals that tend to be the high utilizers of services like crisis stabilization units, emergency departments, jails, or they end up homeless. The team consists of therapists, nurses, peer supports, and psychiatric services, and they work tirelessly to keep these individuals out of those more costly services. Also, the focus of the team is to work with these individuals in their homes and out in the community to stabilize their symptoms and improve their daily functioning. 
The team served over 118 participants over the past fiscal year, and greater than 90% 90, 90 of those participants remained stable in the community and did not need to go to local or state hospitalizations. They also allow for increased care in communities where there's limited or no public transportation, and the team can eliminate and minimize homelessness of at least 15 participants this past year because we're able to provide rental assistance and assistance with utilities. Lastly, throughout the COVID pandemic, the team continued to provide intensive in-home care through delivering daily medications, administering medications daily across two counties, as well as transportation to critical appointments without any interruption. And on top of that, we even added 20 new participants during that time. The team is currently funded though with non-recurring funds. We're here today primarily and once again, not only to ask that you support this effort for 2021, but that this crucial service would be considered for recurring funding. The reality is that this level of funding doesn't really take into consideration that severe and persistent mental illness is not a short-term or a non-recurring illness. This is recurring day in and day out, and for many, it's year after year. For a second year, we've had to maintain a $250,000 reduction from the program's inception, which has forced us to reduce some of the spending on our participants who need supplemental funds for rent, electric, other expenses that let them stay in their community. Throughout the state, there has not been an increase in FACT funding since the year 2000, but the expectations of running the team with 12.3 employees and all of the program fiscal and clinical requirements haven't changed at all. We're asking that this valuable program not only be funded as a recurring item, but at the level that it was originally funded at, which was 1.5 million. I'd like to thank you for allowing us to bring this issue forward and ask that you continue to support the FACT program. We know this has been a challenging year for everyone and the rise in behavioral health incidents has reflected that, which is exactly why our community needs these services now more than ever. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. And, and just a note to you and others, recurring funds, I, which I'm in favor of when they make a lot of sense, why should you every year have to fight for the same things over and over? The, the, the balance of that, the other side of that is legislatures don't want to necessarily tie the hands of people that will come after us and say this funding is already, uh, you don't have any say so in that. So there's there's a balance, I agree, that we when, when you have to come to the Tallahassee and come to these meetings every time to fight for the same thing over and over and try to prove your point again uh, that you've already done. So, so we're, we're going to work on that. Recurring next year will be a real challenge, any kind of funding that's recurring. I'm sure there's some that's already in recurring that will not be, that would be taken out uh, even. So I get it. Uh, I think you'll find two supporters here um, that we can get that and hopefully you can focus on uh, what you're uh, doing versus having to fight for those funding every year. So it'll be a little bit of a battle, but we, we got you. What, was, what you. was the number, what did the number equate to this year, Nancy? Was it 1.2 or 1.3? Uh, the funding was 1.25. Uh, 1.25. I knew we fought hard there at the end to make sure that got included. So, okay. And 1.5 is where we started. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jane West. Is she here? Oh, there you are. Good to see you again. Good You're afternoon. recognized. Good to see you again, Senator Perry. And good afternoon, Representative Payne. My name is Jane West, and I'm the Policy and Planning Director for 1000 Friends of Florida. 1,000 Friends is a nonprofit growth management watchdog that works on a statewide basis to promote sustainable growth in order to preserve our environment, agricultural lands, the economy, and our quality of life. Um, I am going to personalize my comments to address some of the questions that Senator Perry raised during the Alachua legislative delegation. Um, during this upcoming legislative session, we will be prioritizing the restoration of a free-flowing Okawaha River through the breach of Rodman Dam. The reservoir has been documented recently by the district to be unsuitable, I found this out in a report that I can get to you, Senator Perry, as a source of water supply. There is more water available from a free-flowing river than from a reservoir. The pool has little storage capacity to address seasonal needs and treatment is three to four times more expensive than the Floridan Aquifer. In addition, this aging infrastructure turns 50 years old this January. It will continue to be an increasing financial drain with the liability for dam failure resting on the state and taxpayers. 
We will also be carefully monitoring MCOR's funding so that these thro three proposed toll roads don't divert funding from local road projects here in Putnam County. The $738 million that FDOT has committed to MCORs includes $300 million from other transportation funding sources besides general revenue, like the small county road assistance program that Putnam receives funds from. Those transportation dollars will not be available to invest in or upgrade existing roads that could improve access to health here in Putnam County and other critical resources for struggling small counties. As a homeowner in downtown Palaka, I would rather see my tax dollars go towards fixing my street, there's a pretty big dip in front of my driveway right now, than paying for a toll road on the other side of the state. And finally, we urge you to amend Florida Statute 163, 3.215, our Growth Management Act, to bar interveners in development litigation from recovering attorney's fees. If you are going to voluntarily subject yourself to the risk of litigation, you shouldn't get to profit off the backs of local government for doing so. I thank you for your time and I hope I address some of your questions. I'll be following up with documents to that effect. Thank you. Good, thank you. And, and what she, I brought up a question that uh, she brought up on the reservoir. Uh, one of the things the state is doing now is we're, we're investing buying land that we can store water on that used for recharge areas. So my question was, and I appreciate it, and I look forward to getting that information, was is, is the, the reservoir now, are we gonna potentially, would you not have a reservoir, but we're buying other land that we would store water on to recharge? So that was a question, I appreciate any information, you can get that to me. The second question that, uh, that I'd brought up was uh, not just on the MCORs, but we started looking at, a, at data in our district, which is Putnam County, Marion County, and Alachua County, and I used to represent Gilcrest and Dixie, um, and what we've seen there is some, some health delivery inadequacies on areas that don't have good infrastructure from a road standpoint. Putnam County is one of those counties that uh, if you look at health care delivery uh, is not adequate, and, um, and so is that based, what, what are the issues that, that cause that? And we also talk about quality of life, and certainly having uh, good health care access is one of those things. And so we're looking at transportation needs and what are those that would, would uh, not just get people from point A to point B quicker, but would they take the counties that are suffering from adequate health care and provide that. So those are things that we're looking at. We're looking at it in our district. We've already got our staff working on that and we're gonna try to get the uh, state to do a study and look at that statewide as we look at these, uh, whether they're toll roads or bypasses or what are the things that are going to do to help uh, the citizens get better health care. We're trying to look at it uh, from a multiple angle area. So so thank you for that. I look forward to your information. I'd like a copy of your uh, information as well with regard to Im why we would not consider impounding water as the dichotomy of not impounding water for future use needs for quality and quantity purposes. Thank you. Uh, next we have Robert Verstein. Thank you, and you're recognized. Hi, my name is Bob Vernstein. It is V-I-R-N, as, as opposed to the spelling in the agenda. Uh, I'm a marine scientist. I worked in, uh, in the science and management of estuaries for 45 years so far. Uh, I worked at St. John's River Water Management District for 20 years and served on various county committees and organizations. I've lived on the St. John's River in East Palaka for 30 years, across from the barge port. I call myself a river rat. I worked, played, water skied, swam, boated, paddled, fished, sailed on the, on the river and swam across the river a couple times. Uh, for healthcare reasons though, I moved to Gainesville six months ago, but my heart is still in Putnam County and I'm still on, on various committees and organizations. My goal today is to promote the Great Florida Riverway and I believe you have a couple of hand, handouts on, on that. That it's a system of three rivers, 50 springs that need your help and support. And I think it's a great investment. So I wanna, one, describe the current situation, two, describe some problems and concerns and issues with that management, and then describe the ecological benefits and gains from a free-flowing Ocklawaha River. Uh, Putnam County has perhaps the most to gain from this partial restoration. And here, partial restoration refers to the existing approved plan of removing 2,000 feet of the 
200 foot uh, dam. And a, a disclaimer, I have no vested interest in this issue. I'm just here as a private citizen. So the current situation, the Akawaha is dammed and managed really as two separate systems, a reservoir and a river. And a real a basic tenet of ecology is that everything is connected to everything else. But in this case, it really is, that's not true. And there's, so there's a lack of what I would call ecological connectedness. And that's a big, de big deal, that the, two, the systems work together. And dams have a limited life capacity. Uh, Rodman's is 50 years and that's up. Uh, rain, maintenance repairs are coming due at about $4 million. Uh, bass fishing is declining, but other species can provide sport. So the issues with current management, it's high cost, approaching half a million dollars a year by the time you average in upgrades to some of the structures. There's the de decreased flow of about 150 million gallons a day, which is what the city of Gainesville uses. Uh, there are 20 down drowned springs. Uh, migratory fish are blocked. People can't move freely upstream and downstream. And people include uh, boaters, paddlers, fishermen, birders, ecotourists. And at constant high flood stage, 7,500 acres of forested wetlands were destroyed upst upstream of the dam and downstream wetlands were impacted by the lack of natural fluctuations uh, of water levels. Uh, wetlands really require that fluctuation. Uh, so these lost and damaged wetlands don't provide cleansing of water. The growth in, of blue-green algae and floating weeds that are sprayed with herbicides and then rot produce a buildup of, of muck and poor water quality, both within Rodman and downstream from Rodman. And the, the idea that Rodman Pool somehow provides storage, uh, I, it just doesn't seem to jive with science or economics. Rather, a free-flowing Akawaha would provide 150 million gallons per day more flow and more available and of better water quality. So the ecological benefits and gains of partial restoration, we would see an increase in migratory fish, striped bass, shad, mullet, channel, channel catfish, American eels, rays, perhaps sturgeon. Yes, probably fewer bass, but more other fish. Uh, more access for bank fishing, and including bass fishing. Uh, manatees can move up to Silver Springs for a winter refuge. Uh, there's more boating access and ecotourism, and just imagine the possibilities of, of that. Maybe we bring steamboats back. Uh, the wetlands and, and the wet infiltration would, would work. Uh, there would be increased water flow, and then better water quality for the St. John's River estuary, the downstream part, uh, due to the greater flow of cleaner and cooler water helping recovery of the lost eelgrass beds and fewer blue-green algal blooms in the St. John's estuary. And all this would happen at a lower cost than we were currently spending uh, maintaining these two disjunct systems. Uh, and, and I think you had some handouts that include a lot of the information. Uh, if you need any clarification for any of my statements or conclusions here, I'd be glad to answer anything. No, I appreciate you being here and, and like to say the questions, we're not scientists and so that's where we're at. We're just asking questions that uh, to be clarified. And so I appreciate you uh, bringing some of that with us and we've got your contact information so we can continue uh, I think the conversation can be a, a lot more in-depth and look forward to, to working with you and talking with okay. you. I could provide my speaking notes or yeah. if, if you want to you or electronically. Uh, staff, yeah, sure. You can get with them later on that. And, uh, okay. And, that to them and, appreciate and then Gail Hankinson is going to continue the story. Yeah, I've got a question, a couple of questions yeah. for you before you leave, and, and, and you can provide this in the data perhaps. Uh, we would consider that as developed the Aquaha and the, and the reservoir as its own ecosystem currently. I would say. How long, if you were to um, sever the dam, would that ecosystem return to its normal habitat? 
it would take year, it, it would it would take decades actually because okay. part of it is restoring the the forest. Okay, and so uh, with that said, um, and we flow 150 million gallons of water through that, and you can include this in some of your data if you would. 150 million gallons of water that flows through that river. Where does that water ultimately end up? In the ocean. Okay. What's the value in that? It. I would suggest that it has more value flowing through the Lower Ocklawaha and the St. John's River estuary than being kept in a reservoir that tends to cook in the summertime and generate blue-green algal blooms. Okay, and we'll and hear we from those that are against red tide, which is a natural occurring corona brevis in the ocean. If we push that, that sediment out into the ocean, we'll hear about red tide blooms in Jacksonville as well. So those are all the things that go into the equation. I'm not a scientist, but I have studied uh, the area quite a bit, and so I'd be interested in seeing your data. Okay. I, I am a scientist, and I think the wetlands would actually take up a lot of the nutrients that would decrease the risk of algal blooms downstream. Is that loss that you talked about typically due to, to wicking and evaporation? Primarily. Okay. And, and the extra 10 feet of water puts pressure on the spring, so there's less spring flow out of the drowned springs. All right, thank you. Good yeah, question. Alicia, thank you. It's, uh, I think the conversation can get pretty in-depth and to save some yeah. time from some of the other people in here, we'll, we'll set up some time to meet and look at your data. Thank you. And Gail uh, Hankinson, you are recognized next. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you today. Um, um, I've I lived here in Palatka. I worked at the Water Management District for 19 years, and, and I'm, I'm very fond of and concerned about this area. Uh, I believe that Putnam County is arguably one of the most beautiful natural locations in the world. I strongly believe that Putnam County will one day blossom into its full potential, and I think we very well may be on the cusp of that transition today. There is a great deal of momentum building uh, to restore a free-flowing Okawaha River. Uh, I'm not a scientist either, but I feel in my heart of hearts that if you sit down with the scientists, they will be able to answer those questions of why it's more valuable to have this as a natural functioning river than as a dammed river. Um, and I, I encourage you to meet with scientists uh, uh, to discuss those issues. There, nationwide, there is a strong movement towards dam removal <clears throat> because of the damage that it does ecologically to our systems. Um, but there are a number of reasons why this momentum is, is uh, growing right now. And one is that the dam's 50 years old and it's you know near the end of its uh, life and it's going to cost uh, millions of dollars to address the uh, uh, safety and security issues of that uh, failing system. And I think this is a time when we really need to look and see, is that the best investment of our money to repair uh, this dam that was not built you know, to be a recreational lake? It was built to be a cross Florida barge canal. Uh, it never got to fulfill its purpose. Uh, and so now I think this is a real moment of opportunity for Putnam County and the state of Florida to re-envision what this area could be. And I think that uh, if you talk with the scientists, uh, you will be convinced that the natural system is by far superior to a dammed reservoir. But I think as far as the economics of it, the potential is just enormous. Uh, this past semester, a uh, group of students from the University of Florida Department of uh, Architectural, uh, 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 sorry, they, um, I'm sorry, the, the department, landscape architecture. It was a, a group of students with the Department of Landscape Architecture um, spent the semester dreaming up what co sort of uh, economic opportunities might be available in a revitalized riverway. They came up with the most amazing things, and I do believe that they will be shared with you and, and with uh, Putnam County uh, over this next coming year. But um, outdoor recreation areas, supporting bass anglers' desires, but also supporting greater bank fishing, bird watching, nature trails, and hunting areas. 
educational centers that focus on the Native American use along the river, Bartram's explorations here, Civil War connections, the replica riverboats plying the, the waters between Palatka and Silver Springs, outfitters, restaurants, lodges, campsites, all of these things are what could be part of the renaissance of this great Florida riverway. This is not about removing a dam or losing Rodman Reservoir. It's about what we can gain, how Putnam County can flourish and grow, what we can build together that will be valued by anglers, but also by hunters, hikers, historians, paddlers, campers, bird watchers, manatee viewers, and pleasure boaters. I think we can think big about recreational infrastructure here. There are plenty of federal funding sources available, um, and we're happy to work with you. We just need a vision for what this area could be. Reconnecting the Great Florida Riverway, the Ocklawaha, the Silver Springs, and the St. John's by breaching that portion of the earthen dam is supported by more than 40 organizations here in Florida. You heard from Thousand Friends of Florida, but also Florida Audubon, Florida Wildlife Federation, Friends of the Everglades, Save the Manatee Club, are all united in this effort to restore this great Florida Riverway. I urge you to watch the documentary that is on the greatfloridariverway.com website, and you will hear and see the many voices that are joining in this um, effort. Uh, <coughs> great, uh, a great bit from uh, the owner of the lodge in Wallatka, uh, very much in favor of this. So where do we want to be and how do we get there? And I think what, what needs to happen is for Marion County and Putnam County to work together to come up with a regional recreation and, and uh, restoration plan, work together to seek federal funds, um, identify public-private partnerships that will make this the premier state park in Florida. We want to use this year coming up to finish these planning steps through a, a comprehensive planning process. Much of the work is already done. The land is owned by the state. The permit has already been deemed feasible. A $900,000 economic uh, environmental impact statement has been completed. And an economic assessment has shown that a 7.6% annual return on investment would be received in, in uh, restoring the riverway. So we're looking for your leadership on the three rivers, 50 springs, and one solution. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And um, if you could do us a favor, and I think I'll speak for Representative Payne. I know we had a little emergency call right there. Uh, when, when you're talking about data and anything you provide for us would be, would be uh, greatly appreciated. One of the things that, that we try to come to the table as is being an unbiased um, view of these things. So, but there's two sides to every story. So when you talk about it, it, whether it's an environmental gain or some species is going to flourish, what species are not going to flourish? If you're going to have economic activity here, where are we going to lose it? We need that data, and uh, and if you would could provide that to us, so w we want to be able to make a decisions on this issue and anything else that that is not from our personal view or our personal standpoint, but based on on different data on both sides, and we right. need that. So when you make uh, one thing that we'll gain, if we're going to lose, we need to know about that, and so that would be a thing that would be very helpful for us. Um, as we balance these things out on this and every other issue. That's our goal is to be unbiased and make these make good decisions. So it would be helpful. Right, and, and we're definitely trying to provide, uh, for example, on the gold and green scorecard that I provided to you there, you'll see at the bottom there are references of the economic study from the University of Florida and, and giving specific, uh, you know, information of where we've come up with this information. Perfect. And uh, I know that uh, uh, you've stated that you're willing to go where the science leads you, and I, I sure that the science will lead you that, that uh, the restoration uh, is the appropriate choice. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. We have Allegra Kitchens. And after that is Mary Reese. After that, be ready. You're recognized. Thank you for being here. 
Uh, thank you for uh, hearing us. Thank you for allowing me to speak. And Mr. Perry, it's del I delight to meet you in person. Mr. Payne, it's good to see you again. Uh, on September the 21st, 2020, Governor Ron DeSantis announced new legislation to stop violent assemblies and protect law enforcement. The proposed legislation, the Combating Violence, Disorder, and Looting and Law Enforcement Protection Act, creates new criminal offenses and increases penalties for those who target law enforcement and participate in violent or disorderly assemblies. Gentlemen, I'm speaking here on behalf of myself and every law-abiding decent citizen as well as the unlaw-abiding citizens in Florida. We need this protection. We don't want to become like Seattle, Washington, D.C., or any other place where we have had these violent looters and rioters take over our cities. I urge you, I don't know the status of this bill. I tried to find out. I don't know if it's even made it out of committee yet or if it's even in committee. But I urge you to please get this bill to the floor of the legislature and vote for it. We, the citizens, need this protection. As an individual citizen, I will protect my property. But I would certainly like to have the law stand behind me. And on another note related to that, I noticed that there have been God knows how many bills to control guns in the state of Florida between 19, uh, 2019 and this year. Thankfully, they all died in various committees. I would urge you to vote against any gun control laws or any ammunition control laws at all. We, the citizens, need our Second Amendment rights. We need to protect ourselves these days more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Reese. Thank you, and you're recognized. Thank you so much for, for being here, that I don't have to travel to Tallahassee. Um, the good news is I'm not here asking for money. So um, with that, my name is Mary Reese, and I live right here in Palatka. I am a sixth generation of my family to live in Putnam County. I serve in the city of Palatka's Historic Preservation Committee as Secretary of Putnam County Historical Society, and I'm a director of the Putnam County Genealogical Society. I'm a member of several heritage groups, including the Daughters of the American Revolution. History is important to me. I recognize its value and the rich layers that it can add to a community, but I'm concerned that our history is under attack. There's been an epidemic of attacks on monuments, buildings, and historical markers across the nation. And Florida, unfortunately, has not been exempt from these attacks. Just this past Thanksgiving uh, weekend, three U.S. presidents' memorials were vandalized, President McKinley, President Lincoln, and President George Washington across the country. Over the past few years, numerous attacks have taken place on monuments and memorials at veterans' parks. I am shaking so badly, sorry. Uh, courthouses and cemeteries, both on public and private property. They've included Christopher Columbus, Ponce de Leon, uh, Purple Heart monuments, military flag displays, first responder memorials, including firemen memorials by vandals, and even 9-11 memorials have been targeted. These um, are not juvenile pranks. These are planned attacks by adults with an agenda. These radicals have weaponized our historical military monuments and memorials against our local governments by threatening domestic ter terrorism if they are not taken down. Local governments have been forced into spending thousands and thousands of dollars in removing memorials and monuments, not because they want to, but because they are being threatened with violence and are tying up valuable resources in lawsuits, cumulatively spending millions of dollars Trying, trying to protect the history of their community. These monument and memorial attacks are not only disrespectful to those who sacrificed to build them, but very hurtful to the communities by removing their history. My family has a long history of service. Both of my parents were Korean War vets. My father and husband were also Vietnam vets. In fact, my husband died due to Agent Orange injuries he received in Vietnam. My youngest son is a federal attorney for Homeland Security. So when I see attacks on veterans' monuments, it hurts my heart. It is personal. Thank you. We have many monuments and memorials here in Palatka, including several along our riverfront, numerous ones on our courthouse front lawn. These represent veterans and those who supported war efforts in all wars. Most of the small towns in our county have their own monuments, memorials, and historical markers as well. 
I feel that these attacks were never just about getting rid of them, but about something larger, something over, thank you. You knew what was coming. Power and control and wasteful spending of tax dollars. Our history needs protection, and that's why I come here today. In 2018, um, blah, 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 in my research, uh, Mike Hill introduced HB Bill, uh, 90, Bill HB 97, the Soldiers and Heroes Monuments and Memorials Protection Act to preserve history and provide education. He also stated that if public property bearing a monument is sold, the monument must be moved to a place of equal prominence. He um, s stipulated certain consequences or penalties for anyone damaging or defacing those as a third degree felony. It died in the criminal justice subcommittee. The next year in 2019, Soldiers and Heroes Monuments and Memorials was introduced by Dennis Baxley, SB 288. It died in the Community Affairs Committee. This year in 2020, SB 1690 Historical Memorials Protection Act was uh, introduced by Vic Torres. It passed the Criminal Justice Committee this time five to zero, but died in the Rules Committee. And um, I'm just here asking that you can support some kind of legislation that would give um, protection for, for our, our historical markers and, and monuments, as well as stiffer penalties for vandalism and to allow citizens the um, power to stand, to let them have the right to go to court if local governments are, are unable to do so or, or won't act. And that's all I have. I do have a, a copy of a poll uh, from Florida about those maintaining or opposing the monuments as well as pictures of defaced um, monuments that I can, I don't give, give, the staff, that'd be good. give them to them. Sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your yeah. time. And thank you for your commitment and passion. Keep it up, don't lose the faith. Next we have uh, Karen Chadwick. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for being here and you're recognized. Uh, thanks for being here today and uh, giving us an opportunity to speak. Um, I came to this legislative meeting um, last time and I gave you all some pictures of the blockages in Rodman, um, all the aquatic vegetation. And so this time I, I brought back some information. This is right from the FWC um, website that shows you the, um, the spray schedules. Um, find my notes here so I don't forget anything. Uh, yeah, the um, UF economist found that he worked with the Greenways manager and found that during the drawdown, <coughs> excuse me, visitation rates went up 80% compared to, for the same time period compared to the two years uh, prior when the water was up. Um, some of that might be that, yeah, you know, that 80% increase might be because when the, the river's flowing, there's no blockages. That's one reason why they do the drawdown. Um, when the, um, the ramps are, are blocked and you know the river's blocked and the canal's blocked, the campground um, ramp gets blocked, that just got sprayed again. Um, the access is really limited. So um, December 6th, the canal was really blocked up again and just got sprayed and a lot of that some of it goes into, if it doesn't die where it is, it goes into the St. Jones River. And we've just locally been having a conversation about that. There were some photographs. Um, if you can see, I underlined, it's easy to figure out, but I underlined the Rodman sections here. Um, 1130 to 1240, 90 acres were sprayed in Rodman with um, Diquat and uh, 24D. And they used, um, according to their worksheet, 45 gallons each, so that's 90 gallons of pesticides, herbicides, which are called, called pesticides. Um, on 12.7 to 12.11, another 50 acres were sprayed. 
uh, with um, Diquat and 2,4-D, and that's, um, that was another 50 gallons. Um, Diquat was proposed to be banned in, in the UK um, this year. It's been going on for a couple of years because of health risks to um, the farm workers and bird life. And if you go out there and watch them when they spray, I have videos and pictures of it all. Not all, I miss a lot of it, but um, the birds will be right there and they'll, they'll get sprayed with the herbicides too. They just take the wand and spray everything. And um, my neighbor who sprayed herbicides for years, he sprayed out at Rodman a lot. He, he lost his fingernails. He got really bad rashes. He's got COPD. Uh, he never smoked. And um, so he complained about it. He thought maybe it was the chemicals. And it's kind of consistent with the diquat poisoning is what he thought it would be. Because they, they wear gloves, but they don't wear total face coverings and you know respirators and all that stuff. Um, so he just recently had all of his teeth removed. So it's, it's a lot of chemicals that are used and there are health risks to it. Um, so this worksheet here, this shows uh, 250 acres sprayed. And then the, I gave you a copy of the 2019, or the, yeah, 2019 and 20 work plan. That was 500 acres uh, for about six, a little over $62,000. And this one is 30, a little over, it's about over 31,000 acres. So that's like $100,000 100, in herbicide applications, which really would not be necessary with the free flowing river if you go down anywhere like south of uh, Eureka, the river's flowing. I know they spot spray herbicides down there, but it's nothing like they do up here. I know I wouldn't want to talk about using it for um, drinking water. I wouldn't want to drink water out of that with all of those herbicides constantly getting sprayed in there. These are just a couple of the worksheets. They, there's a map here that shows you the sites. I mean, it just gets sprayed over and over and over. And it's, it's an unreliable recreational resource because you never know when you go out there if the um, ramps are going to be blocked. I live five minutes from Kenwood, and there's a picture in um, the newsletter I gave you shows um, um, one of the times when Kenwood was blocked, and it's just, after they spray it, it's just brown and nasty. And, you, and I've done this, you sit there, and the guys, they drive from Jacksonville, um, Orlando, all over the place. They hear how great Rodman is, and they come out there, and it's blocked, and they're like, what's going on? It just got sprayed, so they go somewhere else. And I just really think, you know, with the restored river, we would have a lot more opportunities for recreation. Some of that was mentioned before. Um, and I wanted to show you, I have my captain's license, and I do tours. And this, this was when the, um, the, the virus started. They closed the boat ramps on the Akloaha. So we lost the last month of, of good um, tour season for, we call it drawdown season. So because the ramps were closed, we lost a month of that. But I've got all these people went out on my boat, and this is just a small sample. Not everybody wants to leave a comment. Or like one person in the boat of six will leave a comment. Um, comment after comment. People love going out there. They want to come back. They come from Jacksonville, Georgia, South Florida, Orlando, the villages, people, a bunch of them came up. Um, Oak Hammock brought buses of people out because you can see so much wildlife, so many birds, way more alligators when the river is within its banks. Um, I gave you um, a copy of this map. The Akawaha put Palaka on the map for tourism. And if you look at this, you can see it goes from Palaka to Silver Springs. And there were many, many steamboat landings all along the way. A lot of historical sites. Fort Brook in, is in Putnam County, close to Orange Springs. That would be a great site to stop on the river and have a little visitor center. Um, there's just so many opportunities. <clears throat> Last thing I'll say, I could say a lot more, but I'll leave it at that, except to say when I went to a listening session a couple years ago now, talking about the Akawaha and Rodman, there was a local couple there, and they said they want to see Rodman kept like it is because it keeps people away. And it really does. With the blockages and, you know, the flooding, 
that you can't hardly see any wildlife. You can't see the springs. With the r restored river, we have so many more opportunities. I really hope you'll you'll be unbiased and take a look at this and not just keep it, you know, as a fishing hole. There's so many guys out there fishing, way more guys out there fishing during the drawdown at Kenwood and, and Orange Springs. Orange Springs has been blocked since April. The run, they just sprayed it again, but the, only the airboats can go out there. During the drawdown, this is where the road used to go out to where the ferry went across, that area is accessible. There's a ramp there. So many boats are going out. There's people fishing all along there. There's no blockages, total access. When the water comes up, all that's lost. Good. Thank Thanks. you for coming. Appreciate it. Next up, we have Smokey Sheas here. Welcome, and you are recognized. Senator Payne and uh, Representative uh, Mark Senator Perry, Representative Payne. That promotion I'm you gave <laughs> Well, I'm Smokey Shouse. I'm a lifelong resident of Putnam County. And um, let's see, it was uh, August, August of last year, 19, I was out gator hunting on um, Orange Lake, and I got the, um, the citation for their nighttime airboat ordinance. And um, I went ahead and, you know, it was right, they didn't even announce it or anything until after the gator tags were already drawn. So I hired an attorney and uh, we fought it and the judge said that it was unconstitutional. And then uh, the county appealed it and then the three panel, um, the three judge panel unanimously said that that was unconstitutional. So then the, what Alachua County did was they went back and reworded the, the ordinance. And so instead of fighting that ordinance, because that's what, that's, that's what all these counties are doing, they're just going to reword it. And if you'll look at that um, thing I gave you, it's the Florida Statute 32760. In uh, Section 2E, it says they can't discriminate against airboats unless they have a two-thirds majority. And what we'd like to see is that unless part taken out, just like it is on, right above that on D where it says you can't discriminate against personal watercraft. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention and see if you would just look at it and um, you know, give us some ideas on what we can do there. Because, I mean, it, we're being discriminated against all across the state of Florida. I mean, they're, they're shutting down. They're putting nighttime. People make a living on the rivers and stuff, you know. And there, there's a lot of counties, there's no nighttime riding at all. Alachua County has it now where 30 minutes before dark till 30 minutes after daylight, you can't ride your airboat. Right. And... Um, I appreciate it. I just want to bring that to your attention. Good. I, I've got a question. Yes. How big was the gator? Thank you. How big was the gator? I've got uh, two of them, 13 foot. There's <laughs> some big ones out there. I was at Lock Lucid two weeks we ago and saw a monster. Yeah. 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 Good. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. the time. Uh, Nicole Grace. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming down. Um, not so far for Representative Payne, Senator Kopai. Is that better? It's good. Okay. Um, well, y'all heard me. <laughs> um, I wanted to say thank you, and uh, I'm here as the executive director from Keep Putnam Beautiful, and it's been quite a year, uh, a little challenging. Um, we benefit from the support of the state and we thank you and we certainly benefit from the county as well and the municipalities, um, towns and cities. Um, but most of all, we benefit from our volunteers and their continued service during this year when they couldn't come to large events, they were at home, we gave out cleanup kits and they were able to clean up litter, beautify their areas, just smaller. Um, some of them wore masks, some of them did not. We continue to meet the challenges um, through this year and into next with uh, litter. It's not going away. People keep littering. Uh, our recycling and waste stream education continues. We had to move to a virtual format this year with the school districts, which was very educational for me. 
I know how to edit videos now. Um, and of course, uh, we are still going to be working hard to keep Putnam beautiful. That was my tagline. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Sure. Thank you for what you do. Nicole, thank you. I mean, she's made presentations to our Rotary, Rotary Club and what she does and what your staff does. It's amazing, your volunteers. So thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, Wayne McCain. Good to see you, and you're recognized. Senator Perry, Representative Payne, good to see you. Thank you for your service to our community. I've got my Chamber of Commerce hat on today. I'm the incoming chairman of the Chamber of Commerce, and we have just completed our strategic plan for 21, and I want to here to talk to you and seek your support for broadband throughout our county. Um, Representative uh, Catt has indicated that's going to be one of her number one priorities. And we at the Chamber feel it will not only benefit small business owners uh, within Putnam County, but also our school system. And uh, we would just encourage you to uh, be open to what uh, Representative Katz is going to be proposing. I've met with uh, Terry Suggs, our county administrator, and there has been a resolution adopted by the commission in support of broadband. So I'm just here today to say thank you for what you've done for our county. We appreciate it. And also ask you to be open-minded to uh, things that are going to be happening with broadband. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne. Yeah, we've had a lot of discussions on that. In fact, had two delegation meetings, and that was uh, uh, one of the major topics we've had for rural broadband. And so we're keenly aware of it and know that uh, Congressman uh, Kamak has made it a priority. So uh, thank you for your um, words on that. All right. Thank both of you. Thank you. And even though Kat Kamak may be the youngest female congresswoman, right. Uh, she has a lot of experience working with uh, Ted Yoho for eight years, so I think she'll uh, step right in and be able to be helpful on these things. Thank you. Uh, Tim Hodling. Hotelling. Hotelling, sorry. Keep getting that wrong. Good to see you again, and you are recognized. Tim Hotelling, I'm from uh, San Mateo, overlooking the beautiful St. John's River and Buzzard Island, which is owned by the state of Florida, ignored by the state of Florida, washing away. It at one time had, uh, I counted something like 2,700 white birds that got up at, in the morning and went to work at the farm fields. All in a half an hour, they flew off to pick up all of the bugs and grasshoppers and everything that they do, cattle egrets primarily. There's uh, large numbers of different uh, birds that we had uh, an Audubon in inventory, and it was amazing. But time and time again, they say, can you find a, a threatened species? Is there just one nesting out there? Then we can get the state guys to come and help. We can get a grant. Unfortunately, we haven't found any endangered, but let me tell you, that, that island's endangered, and all of these birds will be endangered too because it's very specific habitat. They're bird islands. They're all up and down. There's one in Wallaca. I was told that there was one in uh, the middle of uh, Lake Mary, I guess it is down in Crescent City. The biggest problem is the State of Florida Department of Environmental Protection Public Lands Administration has their hands full with large tracts of land that Florida Forever program that y'all got to take our tax dollars won't buy anything less than 100 acres. This uh, little island out here it had been quite a big island. It was on the charts way back when, navigational charts. And uh, it's home for thousands and thousands of these birds. And, and, and it's because it's far enough from the mainland that the snakes and the raccoons and everything don't come out and get them. Yet it's still protected enough that it's out of the way. And it's just a pity that the landowner doesn't pay any attention to what it's doing. And what's even worse and more egregious in my mind State of Florida has not taken an inventory to find out how many other of these islands are around here. I mean, I've called and talked and 
you know, I can document it if you like, but uh, um, they had uh, one chap I talked to that had a flyover for the, the uh, blue heron, looking for the bird islands and the nests and everything, but they didn't have the opportunity to GPS it or to check it. And how many of these islands are, are we losing? I have attached to the back of that a study that was done by another chap I talked to, which is, was really good, on how to build your own bird island. So after this one all washes away, and all of a sudden we figure out, dang, all these tourists are coming down here and they want to see the pictures. They want to do the same thing the, the private guys in alligator, the alligator farm in St. Augustine did. They found the birds flying in to see the alligators, so they built the dead gum rookery, and now they've got camera people, uh, birders coming from all over to look at these birds, and we've got them right in the uh, right in the middle of the river. It was high on the list when Palaka tried to put its uh, river taxi in. That was the number one stop. We're going to go look at the birds and get everybody excited, and then we'll go down river but it's washing away because nobody will take a stand up and say, I own that island and I'll take a look at it. I've three years now, I've been asking for somebody to contact the Department of Environmental Protection and say, hey, you begged for 25 years to the federal government, give me this island and Rat Island and the other properties. The feds said, here, take it. So what did, what did we do? We recorded it at the county and threw it in the dadgum safe and they won't open the door and tell me what it takes to get it leased to a fed, uh, state agency so that any of the dozens of really good guys that have said they'd step forward and do something can do anything because unless it's leased, they can't pick a finger. It doesn't cost money. It costs somebody to say, hey, Mr. DEP, would you tell us how many bird islands you got and Maybe take a look in Putnam County. Yeah. I'm sorry, I no. tend to get involved. No, we get it. Involved. I appreciate your passion and work on this for years. Yeah, so let me just say that um, we have spoken to DEP, and we've, we've uh, sent them your letters. We've talked to them numerous times. Yes, sir. Ms. Ms. Leota knows everything and, about this. And if yes. you haven't gotten a response from DEP, we have, we have connected the dots and passed the message. I think they're kind of at a lack of understanding of what actually they would do. So natural progress are Rhodes Island and rebuilds islands. I'm not sure what they would actually do. I won't, I won't say that's their answer, but if you've got a plan or an idea that you can share with them, I'll contact Noah Valenstein oh. personally and ask him to call There's you. two things that need to be done. Number one, the state has a, an overview of all the different kinds of habitats. Mm -hmm. They overlook the, the fact that this is very specific habitat and it's not isolated to that one island. There's the one down in Turkey Island area in Wallaka and, and further on down, and there's, heck, I was told one of the public lands ladies says, oh, islands, they just float away. I says, well, that's really nice. So I spent the first two years on this project digging up old pictures to show that the, ma the island's been there, that it ain't going to float away. I've seen it. And uh, they need to identify and, and acknowledge the fact Dr. Fraser, I talked to him, he understands the, the, that it's specific habitat, and then ask him, how many of these other places do you own that may not be as endangered as Buzzard Island? Yeah. And we've been, our and, office, because of your communication, been in touch with them as well. Uh, you know, w our role, our goal, uh, what we can do legislatively is differently than managing a, uh, uh, any agency at the state of Florida that's under the executive. So. I appreciate your passion. I understand your frustration. What we can do, Representative Payne, we've, we've done it, we'll, we'll continue to do it, is, is reach out and, uh, and give it to the department. We don't have any, just to let you know, we don't have any jurisdiction. I can't make a DEP do anything. That's under the executive. So we can uh, look at how it's not uh, we don't write, have relations. Write some more it. nice letters in. Well, that's what we got to do. And, and I can tell you, in 10 years up there, uh, patience is uh, something you better have. Um, and I've had lost mine a few times um, dealing with different agencies and dealing with different well, you know that guy that's governor ask him to well and something 
yeah, and we reach out to him. The governor, typically when I meet with the governor, he uh, takes you got other some things. staff I and know. says, here, I uh, give oh, him the staff. That's here, me. Here, let me tell you one thing I forgot to say. I'm really humbled when the college guys and everything got screwed, but I just got a $1,000 increase in my cotton picking homeowners rates because we don't have a fire service where I live. And we're fighting, uh, and you're going to see rates continue to go up. That's bills we we fight that battle. That's one of my, my uh, probably the most frustrating yeah. thing I've done is I can't get any help uh, or stuff passed uh, dealing with that kind of stuff. But we're going to keep fighting. We're not going to give up. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. The perseverance, uh, Jim McCarthy. Thank you for being here. Good to see you. You're recognized. Thank you, Senator and Congressman Payne. I figured I'd one-up everybody else and give you another promotion. Wow, I um, just got a huge pay increase. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am Jim McCarthy, the president of the North Florida Land Trust, and as you probably know, we, our mission is to protect the natural resources, historic places, and working lands, meaning farms and ranches in North Florida. Right. We now service a 12-county area. We understand that this is a difficult year for the state budget to go to your opening comments and that you're going, to, uh, um, you, you're going to have to make some very tough decisions. You're going to be asked to solve budget problems and keep the economy growing to create jobs and find solutions for mental and physical health. We make a case that conservation is not only good for the economy, it, is, it, it can help it get back on its feet. And, to the, and it's of tremendous physical and mental health benefits as well. Tourism is our number one industry. People come to Florida to visit our beaches, enjoy our parks, view our abundant wildlife, which by the way is a $4 billion a year business in the state of Florida, fish offshore and in our lakes, kayaks and our canoes, kayak and canoe our creeks and our rivers. In addition, people are moving to Florida in droves. The number one reason that people and companies relocate here is our natural resources and our quality of life. Now is the time to protect that quality of life. If we do not have clean water, they will stop coming. If we do not have places to relocate gopher tortoises and other endangered species, construction will stop. It cannot protect, if we cannot, conduct our, if we cannot protect our military bases from encroachment, their mission suffers. In recent polls, 42% of our residents indicate that mental health has diminished over, over the past nine months. Research shows that green spaces like parks reduce heart rates, lower blood pressure, and stress levels. Exercise is critical to physical and mental well-being. All of these things are solved by conservation. Putnam County is uniquely positioned, actually, and is probably one of the best kept secrets in North Florida for its contribution to the entire area because of its aquifer recharge areas. Those are critically important to us. M many, many folks throughout this entire area believe they get the water from the St. John's, and it doesn't. It, as you know, it comes from the aquifer. Putnam County has an abundant number, an abundance of, 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 of water recharge areas, and those areas need to be protected. And we're willing and able to help with that as best we can. We now have protected about 3,400 acres in Putnam County. We continue to look at more, particularly those recharge areas. We're particularly focused along Rice Creek. We have a willing seller, a willing participant there uh, that has a conservation easement on his property. And we're very much looking for other opportunities. In addition to that, we're working, working with a partner uh, in the water management district to reduce phosphorus and nitrogen in our water systems. It's been highly effective at Doctors Lake and perhaps you're aware of that or will be soon, but we're moving 94% of the phosphorus in, in that project. So hopefully we can take that to other places in the, in, in the state as well. So let's utilize our state and federal and local funding entities to make all of those things happen and get our economy back on track. Let's create jobs, improve mental and physical health, protect our water supply and our way of life while preparing for the onslaught of new residents. Let's fund Florida Forever and Enterprise Florida, which also supports our military operations. We wish you safe travels and with the best of luck in your endeavors. And we thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. That's all the appearance cards I have. Does anybody want to speak that uh, I either missed or needs to be addressed? Commissioner Harvey?
center of pain, representative Payne. I've sat here very patiently. I'm the executive director of Save Rodman Reservoir, which we call Lake Okbawaha. When the federal government gave it to the state, it was Lake Okbawaha. I'm just going to say this. 21 billion gallons of water, 19 feet above sea level. What's important there is when I took Roger Reeder with Channel 12 News out, and I said, Roger, I can drink out of the spillway or I can drink out of the lake if you promise to go drink off of Jackson Atlantic. He said, I can't drink that water. Rip Sampain, you asked the question, where does the water go? Atlantic Ocean, bottom line. That lake is cleaning. Now, people are going to stand here and say it doesn't, but it does. It cleans the water. And it's, if you take a glass of water and you pour it in, it's the same water coming out that's going in. We're using it. And what amazes me, three years ago, on the steps of the old Capitol, Jimmy Buffett was singing the praises of a reservoir for the Everglades cleanup. I'm 59 years old. Everglades cleanup has been my whole life. I've heard about it, and we still haven't cleaned up the Everglades. I applaud them for trying, but this is an ecosystem that bounced back from a big ditch disaster, if you will. And I took another reporter out there not too long ago, and I was telling him about the people who bring water jugs down County Road 350. Y'all seen it. You drive by there. And just about that time, a lady and two children pulled up, and he said, why do you do this? Well, the water I have at home is no good to drink, and I come out to these flowing wells and get water. Folks, this is our ecosystem out here, and it covers a big area. And I get the postcards from all over Florida of people who want to restore the, the Oklawaha, and I appreciate that. But Google Earth where they live. They live in planned subdivision, drained areas of marshland that they filled in, straight canals. There's no straight canals in Florida unless it's dug. All of this, concrete jungles, downtown Gainesville. Give me a break. Live out here where I live. Look at the beautiful place that we live. And if you go from, from Grandin, the Clay Ranch, all the way down, 190 feet down to 19 feet. These Corps of Engineers people knew where to put this. So it's kind of like the chicken and the pig going for breakfast. The chicken's going to make a donation. The pig is going to give his life. So restoration is going to take out that. But I do want to say one thing. I congratulate the speaker who finally suggested that we do own everything. Because for, we just had a lawsuit where they said we didn't own it. But when the federal government gave the land to Florida, they said, here, Everything you think we have, plus what you might think we have more of, it's all yours. And we're managing it well out there. So thank you for your time. I just couldn't sit there any longer. So thank you. Good. Thank you. I, still, I want to know why you, have, why you have constituents with bad drinking water at their home, though. We, we, we're working on that, too. Uh, seeing... No more public comments. We do have to elect a new chair and vice chair. That's going to be pretty easy here. I'm going to nominate <laughs> Representative Payne to be the chair. I will nominate you to be the vice chair. And can we oppose and be? No. If, you're, if you're Bradley and Cummings, you can, because they did that to me two years in a row in Clay County. So. so we have a new chair and vice chair for the next upcoming year. Listen, I appreciate you guys coming out here, and, and especially you uh, staying to the bitter end of this thing. But it's more important and we get a lot more out of it we meet personally and we're open to do that anytime we man uh, this office can I say man this office I don't know if I can do that anymore uh, we have someone here at this office in uh, <laughs> the governmental complex here uh, we're trying to do that on a regular basis to be a little tighter once we get into session uh, but we'll have someone here on a regular basis so you know you can come here and meet with myself or, or one of my representatives because we cover Gainesville and Ocala uh, but Please reach out to us on any issue. We can talk. We'll meet in person. We can do it on Zoom or whatever's convenient for you. I like in-person meetings still and uh, value that, but I'll meet any way that you want to on these. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.